Okay, so let's talk about antibodies. What they are, how they work, how they get made. The first question is probably, how do antibodies kill things or otherwise protect you? Because it's not exactly as easy as, um, you know, an antibody uh, binds to something and then that thing dies, right? The antibody itself does not harm anything. What the antibody, well, mm, sort of. Um, the antibody itself does not kill anything. The antibodies work through uh, uh, six different possible pathways, some of which we've talked about before, some of which we haven't. So the first, and this is one that we've talked about before, is opsonization. So uh, a bacteria or potentially virus or anything small enough to be phagocytized uh, gets labeled with antibodies and uh, phagocytes, particularly neutrophils, but also macrophages, dendritic cells, things like that, um, have receptors that allow them to recognize the antibodies and the antibodies act as basically a big eat me sign. So even things that are normally resistant to phagocytosis, such as things that have uh, um, uh, capsules on them, once they get labeled with antibodies, the uh, phagocytes just go, oh, well, this is clearly something that I should be destroying, and they kill it or eat it, All right? So antibodies are one of the most potent opsonins out there. The second, and we've talked about this a little bit as well, is the complement system. So we know that the complement system has three methods of activation. One of those is uh, the classical pathway, which is activated by antibodies. So this is uh, particularly used against bacteria, um, especially for, for one part of it, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, but the binding of antibodies to the bacteria or whatever um, can initiate a complement cascade, resulting in the formation of C3 convertase, which makes C3B, and C3A, C3A, of course, stimulates an inflammatory response, which if you have antibodies is probably already going on. Um, C3B acts as an opsonin, which antibodies also do. So there, like it's kind of like sort of icing on the cake. Uh, but it also results in the conversion of uh, C5 into C5A and C5B. And C5B uh, is going to assemble the rest of the complement protein, C6 through 9, into the MAC complex. And the MAC complex, or membrane attack complex, is going to poke these really, really big holes in uh, the membrane of the bacteria, particularly in the outer membrane of gram negatives. Um, and that's going to compromise the integrity of uh, the cell, letting good stuff that the cell wants to keep inside out, and also letting bad stuff um, things like uh, uh, peroxidases and stuff like that get into the cell where they can wreak havoc and destroy the cell. Third is uh, immobilization. And so this is particularly effective against motile bacteria. So motile bacteria have flagella, and flagella are a pretty potent uh, virulence factor, right? So the bacteria being able to run away from a bad situation to try to escape your white blood cells, um, to, to run away from toxic chemicals, and to run towards the um, places where it is going to do the most damage uh, really allows 
bacteria to have a lot more infective potential. Um, these flagella, of course, are kind of like little whip-like tails that act as propellers. Well, flagella is a very strong antigen. It's one of the things that you make antibodies to very easily. And as you can see here, the flagella will get labeled with the antibodies, and that's the antibodies are these big, bulky things that basically make it so that the propeller jams up and is no longer useful. So bacteria, once they are immobilized, um, are very easy for your, much more easy for your immune system to catch. So it basically is going to compromise uh, one of the main ways that some bacteria have of avoiding your immune system. Fourth is cross-linking. Now this is a little bit complicated, um, and it has to do with the fact that antibodies have two binding sites at least. Right? So even monomeric antibodies like IgG, which I'll talk about in just a second, have at least two. Some, and the ones that are best at this cross-linking activity, will actually have up to 10 binding sites on five antibody subunits. Well, that means, as you can see here, And each of these is going to have other antibodies coming off of it and more bacteria. Um, you'll have like one antibody that might bind two different bacteria. And then one of those two bacteria will be bound to another antibody that binds to a separate bacteria. But what you end up is basically uh, this huge complex that is going to attach all of the bacteria to each other. And that circumstance, first off, they can't run away, so they're effectively immobilized. Um, but also, there's so much of them bound together by antibody that they kind of fall out of solution. Like, they're usually suspended in your blood, um, but once there are so many of them connected together, they're so heavy, that they have a tendency to fall out of solution, particularly in, like, uh, mucus, and um, they will just get carried, this whole big complex of them will just get carried away. Um, but also, when you have all of these bacteria kind of bound together, uh, it prevents them from being able to effectively spread out and um, spread an effect infection further. So that is cross-linking. The fifth way that antibodies act to protect you is uh, antibodies can stimulate what's called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. This is something that's usually used against infected self cells, right? So your cells that have been infected by a virus. Um, so your cells are often going to be too big for a neutrophil to effectively phagocytize. Uh, they don't have flagella on them, and they uh, are often going to be uh, resistant to the complement system because if your complement system targeted your own cells, you know, that would be bad. Uh, so we know that there are several things that direct... Uh, uh, parts of your immune system, specifically cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells, towards virally infected self cells. Um, but one of the things is that when those cells become uh, coated in antibodies, usually antibodies to viral coat proteins uh, that get expressed on the surface, particularly in enveloped viruses, um, these sort of like opsonins direct neutrophils and phagocytic cells to phagocytize a bacteria, these antibodies direct natural killer cells to dock nearby and release their death package, which then kills the cell. So it directs your 
your cytotoxic system, natural killer cells, uh, to kill virally infected cells that can be detected with antibodies. The last method, neutralization, is primarily used against extracellular viruses, virus particles or virions, as they're normally called, as well as non-cellular toxic molecules, like say, um, uh, tetanus toxin or uh, rattlesnake venom or something like that. And the way it works is that um, the virus or the antibody binds to the virus or binds to the toxin along the, so this virus is like coated in little things. I like to think of them as being like keys. And these keys are special proteins that unlock the cell. Those are the things that convince the cell to take the virus in. Virus usually can't get inside the cell on its own. The cell has to welcome it in. And they do this by pretending to be things that the cell wants to have, like food particles. Uh, and if you have antibodies binding to all of these keys, then the keys don't work anymore. And the virus is not dead. Technically, viruses aren't alive, so they don't die. But the, the, the virus is now incapable of doing you any harm, right? Its ability to infect cells has been neutralized, and eventually it just hangs out until your body flushes it out of your system because it is paralyzed. Same with toxins. Right? Most, I should say, poisons or venoms or something like that, um, but most toxins that are produced by living things, um, are the way they work is by interacting with the cell in some specific way. They either attach and block a receptor or they attach and activate a receptor. So for instance, um, the tetanus toxin is going to attach itself to receptors in muscle cells and cause them to become constantly active so that your muscles lock up and you become paralyzed. Uh, in order to do that, they have to be able to bind very specifically to your cell's receptors. If the toxin is bound to these big antibodies hanging off of it, then basically it can't interact with your receptors and so it becomes functionally useless. The toxin's still floating around in your blood, but it can't do its toxin thing because it can't actually bind to your cells. So it is neutralized. So for every antibody, um, there are several different what are called classes of uh, antibodies that can be made. And so this is, is like, uh, you say you have an antibody to, I don't know, um, influenza, all right? You can make that same influenza antibody in any of these classes. And they're made for different purposes and they're often going to specialize or be better at particular tasks. The first is IgM. All of these antibodies are gonna start with Ig. Ig stands for immunoglobulin, which is just a fancy word that means antibody. So these are class M antibodies, IgM. Uh, they're the first antibodies that get made. So when a B cell is stimulated to activity and becomes a plasma cell, it begins producing IgM. Um, now, with T-independent activation, this is usually the only antibody that gets produced uh, because there's no helper T-cells being activated, so there's no class switching that goes on, and so the plasma cells start making IgM, and there's nothing to tell them to switch to making anything else. 
So it's the principal class that is produced for T-independent antigens, the first antibody produced in any response. IgM is particularly good at neutralizing viruses and toxins because it has so many different binding sites, and it's very, very good at cross-linking things together. Again, because it has so many different binding sites. Each of these antibodies has two binding sites, and IgM is a pentamer, which means it's five antibodies bound together, so it can bind up to 10 different bacteria. Uh, that isn't to say that it, it doesn't do anything else, um, but binding lots of things is what it does best. Cross-linking, immobilization, neutralization, these are the things that it uh, does best. Uh, it also is a potent activator of the complement system. So the second antibody class is IgG, which is a monomer. So it's one Y-shaped antibody with two little grabby ends on each of its arms. This is the most abundant antibody produced in your body fluids. So that would be your blood and the interstitial fluid between the cells of your tissues. Um, it takes longer for your body to start producing uh, IgG, right? You have to start making IgM first and then you have to be stimulated to switch to making IgG. Uh, it is the longest lasting of the antibodies with a half-life of 21 days, which means that um, fair amounts of IgG are going to stay in your bloodstream for uh, potentially several months after uh, your infection. Uh, it's the antibody of memory. So when memory cells encounter an antigen potentially years down the road, they start making IgG pretty much immediately, almost at the same time they start making IgM, and they make a lot of IgG. So this is produced very quickly in the memory response. Uh, IgG it works through stimulating phagocytosis, so it's a very potent opsonin. It activates the complement system through the classical pathway. And it's also a stimulator of antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So that's that directing natural killer cells to infected self cells. Um, it can be involved in cross-linking and immobilization, but it's not as good because it only has so many binding sites. Um, it does directly neutralize viruses and toxins, it can mobilize modal organisms, and it can cross-link antigens. Um, it's not as good at those things as uh, IgM is, but it does do them. Uh, IgG is also the only class of antibody that is transported across the placenta. So this antibody is the one that is going to provide passive immunity to developing fetuses in utero. Um, and because it has a long half-life, it can actually stay in the blood for several months, uh, IgG continues to provide passive protection for uh, yeah, up to three months after birth. It's just hanging out inside of the blood. It's also um, produced in, so the first breast milk uh, that is produced, like in, in just the first day or two, uh, is actually a clearish substance called colostrum that is full of IgG, which can be absorbed into the infant. IgA is the most abundant antibody 
produced. Now, I just told you that IgG was the most abundant antibody in your blood. So if you're making even more IgA than you do IgG, that tells you it's not located in the blood. And in fact, IgA is uh, often called secretory IgA. There are some IgAs that are non-secretory and are found in the blood, but most IgA is secretory IgA, and it's found as a dimer, and it's located in body secretions. So primarily what that means is very high levels in mucus, tears, and saliva. The primary job of IgA is to prevent infection, right? So you make a lot of it in your mucus and it's gonna to bind to things that are trying to get into your body and prevent them from being able to cross your barriers. Uh, it also prevents colonization and infection of the alimentary canal and sometimes the lungs and other organisms that don't actually get into your body but just replicate inside of your tube. And they protect you from that. Since this is found in bodily secretions, breast milk is one of those bodily secretions. And uh, so this is the antibody that provides protection to nursing infants. Um, we think that it is in fact not absorbed very readily into the body. Um, and so primarily what it does is it provides mucosal protection uh, to the intestinal tract of infants, uh, preventing bacteria, viruses, whatever, from being able to get in through that route. And uh, that's probably good because infants have a tendency to put whatever the heck they find in their mouth. So it's a pretty common route for pathogens to come in. Um... IgD, so IgD's function is not well understood. When it's found in the blood, which it is found very rarely in the blood, it doesn't, there are very small levels of it in the blood. Uh, and when it's found in the blood, we don't know what it's doing there. We think that IgD is involved in uh, the development of B cells is actually very, very, very similar to the B cell receptor that membrane bound antibody like thing found on naive B cells before they're activated. Um, so we think that IgD might be like an intermediate stepping stone while uh, the B cell is developing and going through. Uh, it's life changes. Last one, IgE, um, is best known for its uh, relation to, uh, let's see here, best known for its relation to allergic reactions, um, type 1 hypersensitivities, which most allergic reactions are, are mediated by IgE. That is, of course, not the main uh, way that IgE acts in your body. Um, that's not why your body makes it. It's not trying to have an allergic response. In fact, we believe that IgE is very important in fighting off parasitic infections, specifically from uh, uh, worms and other helminthic parasites. All right, so where do antibodies come from? So your B cells and helper T cells, um, each one of them can make a different antibody, a different antibody receptor or T cell or B cell receptor. And you have potentially millions of B cells in your body and each of them makes a different antibody. 
Now, antibodies are proteins, and proteins are coded for by genes. So does that mean that your genome has millions of different antibody genes? No. You have, like, two antibody genes. But they're very complicated genes. And while a cell is developing from being, you know, an immature, newly made cell to being a fully competent B cell or T cell, this gene uh, is going to change. And this allows, when it changes, every B cell to make a totally different um, uh, receptor. Now, antibodies have what are called constant regions and variable regions. So you see this antibody up here? This is the tail. These are the arms. So all this stuff in red is the constant region, usually called F sub C. That's going to be the same for every antibody. Um, this blue region and the dark gray region at the tips is the FV. That's going to be different in every B cell. That's what's called the variable region. The FV is the bit that binds to things. And the way you construct your FV is that this gene, the antibody gene, originally, like in all of your, your cells that don't make antibodies, where it's basically left alone, it's a huge freaking gene with a whole bunch of different versions of many segments. It has what's called the V region, and it has 40 different options for the V region. It has about 25 different options for the D region, and it has six for the J region. And most of your cells don't make antibodies and they don't do anything with this. They have them all, right? But in antibody-making cells or in T cells, um, in immune system lymphocytes. What happens is that when you assemble the gene that's going to get made, the protein that's going to get made, is like you pick one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. It's, uh, I, I kind of think of it, and this is just a me term, you're not going to find this in any textbook, um, but I kind of think of this as being the Chipotle model, And that's because I was sitting at Chipotle eating one day, and uh, I was reading their cup. Their cups have, like, interesting facts about Chipotle and stuff on them. And, uh, and, and one of the cups I was reading noted that uh, there are actually, um, like, over a uh, hundred million different things that you can get at Chipotle. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird, because it's, like, the same five ingredients, like, you just go through the line. It's like, you want brown or white rice? Black or pinto? Uh, what meat? What salsa? Cheese? How do you want it? But then you kind of think about it and you go, okay. Well, each of these things can be combined in different ways. And each of them could be extra or missing. So you could have a burrito with white rice, extra black beans, steak, and cheese. Or it could have that same thing as a quesadilla. That's two different things. Or you could have that burrito with brown rice instead of white rice. That's a different thing. You could have it with extra brown rice and no beans. And that's a different thing. So for each of these, like, six ingredients that you have to choose from, they can be combined in so many different ways that, yeah, you do the math. It is, like, 100 million different possible combinations.
And this is how your body produces so many different antibodies from one gene. What happens is when the, uh, uh, when the cell is developing, you pick one V. You pick one D and you pick one J. So you could pick, say, V3 and D1 and J1. Or you could pick V3, D1, and J2. And those are going to be different. Or you could do the same thing, but pick V4 instead. V4, D1, J1. And that's going to be different. So each of those is going to provide a different variable region. In addition, um, the process that combines these things together is very mutation prone. It's particularly prone to frame shift mutations. So um, if you get a mutation, that's going to change all of the stuff in the variable region after the mutation. Um, and uh, so once you have all of these different combinations, and each one could have mutations at any of the joining regions, and those mutations are going to be mutating different segments, yeah, there's like potentially billions of different antibodies that your body could make. So this process is called gene rearrangement. It happens in both B cells and T cells. Um, so you can have more than 100 million different antibodies, sometimes a lot more than 100 million different antibodies that are possible to make, but all from like two genes, because everyone gets one of these genes from mom and one of these genes from dad. And uh, from those two genes, you can make hundreds of millions, billions of different things. Now, most of them actually get eliminated. And this is because of selection. So there are, um, there, there are basically uh, two types of selection that happen, what's called negative selection and positive selection. So your B cells, which are trained in your bone marrow, so after they have developed, right? So they've done their choosing. They go, all right, I'm going to pick V2 and J3 and D4. All right, and it's put them together and it started making its, uh, its antibody receptors. It is then run through basically an obstacle course of uh, self antigens in the bone marrow. It is going to be exposed to basically all of the things that your body might make or at least all of the things that your body might make that face the outside world. Um, and if it binds to any of them, <coughs> killed. Apoptosis. So that's negative selection because it's killing things that bind. The binding results in a negative event. If you bind to self, boom, you get dead. This is critical for preventing you from making self-directed antibodies, uh, for making antibodies against your own cells. T cells uh, undergo both positive and negative selection um, because they have a second requirement. They don't just bind a thing. That thing has to be displayed on an MHC. So they undergo positive selection, which is like the binding event is met with a positive result, and if you don't have a binding event, you die. They have to bind to MHC. 
If they don't bind to MHC, boom, dead. So that's the first thing. They gotta bind to MHC. Secondly, they undergo negative selection where they're run through a similar obstacle course in the thymus where they're exposed to all of the different things that might be displayed on an MHC protein, like, you know, self, all of your various self antigens that, that get displayed on MHC1s. Um, and if they bind to anything there, boom, dead. So they have to recognize MHC and they can't recognize any other self antigen. And what that means is that like, there's a lot of different self antigens out there. Most of the white blood cells that are made are actually killed. Up to 90 or over 95% of developing T cells will be killed off in the thymus because they either don't do their job because they don't react to MHC or they do their job too well and they react to your own body. The development of antibodies and lymphocytes doesn't end with activation. So uh, at each step, we have what's called clonal selection, which means that um, the ones that are unsuitable die off and the ones that are suitable reproduce and make, ostensibly at least, clones of themselves, identical copies of themselves. And each antibody has only a single thing, a single part of a virus or a bacteria or whatever that it recognizes. And usually you won't have just one B cell or T cell that becomes activated. Usually you'll have a number of them and each of them will become activated uh, responding to a different part of the antigen. So for instance, if you have a, um, say you've got an influenza virus and it has these sort of round looking bits on it and it also has some other proteins in its, um, envelope, you might have some antibodies which bind to these round knobby bits, and then you might have other antibodies which bind to these triangular bits. And so you'll probably be making several different antibodies that bind to different parts of the same pathogen. Um, these bits that they bind to are called epitopes. Um, and lymphocytes that respond to the epitopes are stimulated to reproduce. That's a part of activation. Once they are, uh, so the, the, the general life cycle of a lymphocyte starts off with an immature lymphocyte, which doesn't have receptors yet. It hasn't selected its V, J, D, whatever. That's immature. Um, a naive lymphocyte has receptors and has gone through the obstacle course in either the blood, bone marrow or the thymus and has been selected. So it's theoretically at least safe, right? It didn't respond to any self antigens. That's a naive lymphocyte. An activated lymphocyte is one that has bound to its antigen and become activated uh, and received confirmation and is able to reproduce and grow more of itself. So this would be a B cell, which has responded to its antigen and then also received confirmation from an effector uh, 
helper T cell and is gonna go off and destroy the infection. It's a helper T cell that has been uh, prompted for activation by a macrophage, anything like that. So that's an active lymphocyte. Activated lymphocytes can differentiate when they reproduce. They can either reproduce into effector lymphocytes. These are things like plasma cells, cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells that go off and do something and create an effect. Or they can reproduce into memory lymphocytes, which don't go off and do stuff, but hang around for a long time waiting for the next time you get infected. And last, um, antibodies actually change over the course of an infection. And that's because mutations can occur. So say you have this B cell right here. It's the first B cell that gets stimulated. It makes antibodies that bind pretty good. And this B cell reproduces and reproduces and reproduces and reproduces. And most of the B cells that it makes are going to be exactly the same as it, but some of them might have mutations. So here we have a mutant cell making a slightly different variant of the antibody. That variant of the antibody does not bind as well. Well, the better the antibody binds to the antigen, the faster the cells reproduce. So this one that doesn't bind as well isn't going to reproduce as quickly and will basically get swamped out and it won't be represented in the next generation. But sometimes you might have a mutation that actually increases binding. So here we have our B cell reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. The vast majority of the things that it it makes are going to be exactly the same, but here we have a mutation that happened and that mutation actually binds better. That means that this mutant cell is going to reproduce faster than this normal cell. And since it's reproducing faster, that means that eventually it's going to outcompete it. And that original cell will no longer be made. And all of the Resulting cells will be of this mutant variety that binds better. So over time, antibodies tend to change, and they change in a way that makes them, at least we hope, better antibodies. Certainly it changes in a way that makes them bind better to their initial target. But very occasionally, the mutation will cause them to bind better to their original target, but might also allow them some level of cross-reactivity with a self-antigen, because this mutant was never actually screened against self-antigens. And so if it binds a lot to the bad guy, but a little to you, that's the sort of thing that can result in autoimmune disorders. All right, so that's antibodies. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and I will be uploading them.